Thank you, Ray. And uh, Ray said I, I, uh, he was glad to have me back uh, in the Forage group. Uh, and uh, and uh, I guess nobody's more grateful than I am to be back in that group. So uh, doing this, and I tell my, I say in front of my wife, who says, don't say this, that I said, I'm doing productive things again. So uh, now what I would like to do is try to be productive for the next 30 or so minutes talking about renovating pastures or, or hay fields two novel end to fight tall fescues. So everybody here, we're good to go? All right, so let's get started. Oh, uh, first I should, I should thank my, uh, the co-developers of this presentation and especially to Craig Roberts who, for the graphics about the, uh, the killing and the spraying that we're about to see. But we certainly, we visited uh, on a couple of conference calls this group uh, and some of you may recognize Dennis Hancock's name. All right, all right. I'll give it my best, give, give him the field day voice, right? Okay. All right, so here we go. Uh, but anyway, we, had, uh, we were, uh, worked together on this presentation. If you're a little bit of a nervous or a impatient uh, meeting goer, tour, like I am sometimes, this is the roadmap. Just three parts, right? Uh, and so we're going to talk about four methods of trying to reestablish, uh, trying to uh, actually get into the position of seeding novel into fight tall fescues, number two. A little bit about the establishment problems that are common for all types of seedings, but especially these. And then finally, we'll have a few slides about managing it the first year. So let's look at the four methods. We're gonna we'll spend a lot of time <clears throat> talking about killing the old tall fescue. And this is pretty unique. This the scenario going from infected fescue to non-infected or to, to novel endophyte tall fescue is very unique in that we really need to be assure ourselves that we have killed, graveyard dead, the old tall fescue. So we're going to look at four scenarios to do just that. The first one is called, uh, we'll call the spray, smother spray with a summer crop used in the summer. First spray comes after you have uh, in uh, the peak of the sp uh, fescue growth in the spring, takes care of the old stand, the weeds. Isn't that slick? Craig made the old grass die, you know. Uh, then we've got dead grass to, to deal with, but we can drill then into this, the summer annual grass into this crop. We then need to finish that up and look for escapes and kill the, the smother crop uh, in, in preparation for seeding. And then we're into the business of seeding the novel tall fescue. Here's a little bit of the way that looks. This is after the first spray. A, a note about when we're talking about a translocated herbicide, the, the Roundup, the glyphosate types, is most effective when plants are actively growing. So we need some leaf area. It needs to be actively growing. And should we get into a super hot, dry drought, that compound, and, and, and frankly, most compounds are not very effective when a plant's not actively growing. So prior to this being looking the way it does, it was green and, and uh, growing. Here is a good thick summer annual stand, which helps smother as well as give you some, some income and grazing or hay for the summer. And there we are. So the next one I want to talk about is, is uh, winter smother. And we'll use an example from Missouri, where we actually start at a different time of the year. We start here in the late summer, where we will spray the translocated herbicide we will, certainly that knocks down the existing forage. And this is a scenario, too, where you've got to make sure that the, the stand is actively growing. If we come out of summer and we have one of those really, really hot, dry falls, then we need for a, to have a little rain for that, for that herbicide to be effective in knocking down the tall fescue. But the neat thing about any of these spray, blank spray programs is you've got more than one look to kill that tall fescue. And that's really going to be crucial for this, these uh, scenarios. So there you go. We've got dead grass now after the first spray. You put in the, summer, the winter smother crop. And in this case, uh, we'll talk about a, a winter annual. You've got growth in the fall, probably a little bit. In the, in the early spring and spring, you've got a lot. Okay, So you're able to, to utilize that field for, uh, in the meantime, then you're going to look at the, after, you, after the winter annual has done what it's going to do for you, hay or grazing, kill it, 
and spray down what's left. And you've got another look to make sure you've got the old tall fescue done. Then you, what they do is leave it summer fallow. And you may choose to try to do something exceedingly brief in this period with another summer annual grass, uh, but certainly you've got that option to do that or just let it lay fallow and then look at a third spray in the, the fall to make sure you're really uh, going to have a clean, <coughs> excuse me, clean field. And then you put in the, no the novel tall fescue. Here's a look at, at uh, this is Brookfield, Missouri, north central Missouri, Craig. Yeah, okay. This is uh, the Davis Farm, north central Missouri. Old fescue was sprayed on September the 4th. Cereal rice seeded September the 11th. Began grazing in early November. Came back in the spring and you had cereal rye, as it does, growing like mad, right? Knocks it down and makes graze and hay throughout the spring. Harvested May 17, was able to get a phenomenal yield off of this field. So, and then, of course, we go into the summer fallow and, and then sp and spray if needed, but probably spray again the next fall, uh, late summer, in advance of putting the novels into fight into that field. And the method we have used quite a lot in Kentucky is the spray, wait, and spray method. In fact, you'll hear about this more than once today, once from me and once probably from John Thomas this afternoon. Of course, we've got the standard tall fescue growth curve, uh, and we will clip and we'll control seed heads this spring. And if, you're, if you put yourself in that scenario where this is the current timeline for us, okay, one of the crucial things about this transition is you don't want that tall fescue that you have to make, as it can, 300 pounds of seed to the acre for you to deal with. And it can easily make 300 pounds of seed to the acre. So you have to clip, graze, manage to minimize that seed production and ideally knock it to zero. But tall fescue is a persistent rascal. Uh, it will try to make a seed head even after you've done heroic things. Okay, So just realize that it has a propensity to make seed and that's how it's stuck around as long as it has. So we, can, we need to manage it to control that, uh, to knock it down. Then, you know, the timing for your first spray will depend on how that field is coming along. And I'm going to talk from the John Thomas Madison County experience because we went into a summer, I'm trying to think how far back it was, a couple of years ago, we had a really dry one and it just didn't grow very much. And so we, they waited and they waited for it to come back enough to expect that Roundup to work, right? Then it was then by late summer they were able to spray, wait, spray, and seed. And I'll show you what that looks like the following year. But that first spray, of course, is going to kill that old tall fescue that we've managed to prevent seed head production. There we go. It's, it's, we knocked it down. We got a second shot to kill whatever comes back. And we have used this method successfully on horse farms as well. Uh, one that's right close to my house. Uh, now I was, uh, for a lot of reasons, I wanted to see it quite often. It's just more fun to do a field trip, I mean a, a farm visit in the afternoon than to wait around for all the crazies to get done at the hospital and try to beat them home. So uh, no offense to the hospital folks. I'm a, I'm a frequent flyer, so I like that. But at any rate, the uh, this is the scenario we're looking at, but, but on the horse farms, we've used it successfully to go back to orchard grass and to indefi uh, novel endophyte tall fescue as well. And of course, it puts us in a great position to then seed in no-till that novel endophyte product. This is uh, courtesy of John Andre in Clemson. The second kill will, will second spray will kill the escapes like you see. And then this is the first summer after seeding in Madison County. Now, Brandon Sears, the, the county agent, was very careful to get the, the drill calibrated right, and, and he drilled this two ways, uh, and we did get a timely rain late that fall. Uh, and you can see, this is actually after a first cutting, a clipping. This is midsummer. So uh, an exceptional uh, establishment uh, success and I'm going to credit John Thomas, and he must be going to church twice a week, you know, because that is really 
about as good as, as I've ever seen for this stage, and he'll talk more about that. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, I hope I haven't stolen too much of his thunder. Maybe it was three times a week to church. I'm not sure. So, All right, and of course, you know, if you're in the scenario where you can disc or prepare a seed bed, that's, that, that works also. In fact, you know, I should have said at the very beginning, there's a shopping list of about six or eight things that need to happen for successful establishment, period. And, and those rules never get suspended. Sometimes we're able to, to kind of maybe not pay attention to all of them because Mother Nature is in our favor. But I guarantee you, Mother Nature has about six or eight rules that have to be followed to, in order for us to be successful. Uh, creating a clean, fine, firm seed bed is what the, the aim of this is. And that is what the no-till plus herbicide does as well. So no-till plus herbicide, I mean the herbicide plus a no-till drill puts us in the same scenario as a prepared seed bed where we've taken the time to, to remove excess vegetation, disc it, do what you need to, get the seed bed fine and firm because we don't need to seed this material very deep at all, a half inch max, and the water has got to move up in the profile of the soil to get to that grass seed in order for it to germinate. And I've got all of the, uh, the uh, t-shirts from mistakes about fluffy seed beds, okay? Just don't go there. You know, make, make it, uh, don't let it be fluffy. So this is from John Andre at Clemson where he's got a spray weight spray plan going on on the right, a clean till on the left, and equivalent stands both sides, as you would expect, as you'd expect. So we've hit our four methods, all right? So if you're remembering our, our, our road map, we've got two more to go, right? So let's finish strong. Let's talk a little bit about establishment problems. Somebody else, you know, your neighbor's going to have establishment problems. You're not. So let's be ready to talk to your neighbor about how are we going to, uh, you know, be ready to prepare ourselves not to have this difficulty. So if you look at the, the source for this material, these, these uh, reasons why seedlings fail, seedings fail, came from the uh, fourth edition. I think this is the fourth. Sixth edition. You can tell... 15 years asleep in administration, I missed two editions, right? But uh, the, the authors, it's worthy to talk about these guys a little bit. Uh, uh, Barnes, Nelson, Collins, and more. If you're going to have a, a, the forage uh, all-star team of all time, those would be the four guys you'd want. And, uh, of course, Jerry Nelson, the second author, uh, and I and Craig overlapped at the University of Missouri together, and Mike Collins was here, Ken Moore also up in that area, Illinois, Iowa, I'm not sure, but uh, at any rate, uh, an excellent source, a resource for us. I skipped a couple of slides, and these are probably in your presentation because it, I wanted to get right to the things that we want to make sure don't happen to us, right, when we go into this. Uh, the main reasons why these novel seedings are less than we wanted, right? So, poor kill. Now, we've we spent four, we got four ways to kill the old tall fescue. And, uh, you know, so we've got ample ammunition, but if we don't get the old stuff killed, then we will have issues with establishment. Now, you've got to probably put on any list bad seed. And one of the things you'll hear from me and subsequent speakers that is that the Alliance for Grassland Renewal has gone to some pretty unique and I'll say extraordinary, certainly above the call of duty, uh, measures to make sure you don't end up with bad seed. Okay? And you'll, uh, you'll, I think you'll agree. Too deep. Boy, do I have this t-shirt. Okay? Fluffy seed beds, that'll happen. It's going to happen. No-till seedings, two sprays of Roundup that were heavy clover stands, and that became almost like it would plowed up. And even though I knew that it was using a tie drill that I've worked with for years, uh, you know, it went too deep. And I'll tell you, we'll, go, we'll do it outside because we're going to work with a tie. But if you don't see some seed on top of the ground, something's wrong. Either it's too deep or you're not seeding, okay? And I knew that, and I still made that mistake uh, this past fall 
And as my father would tell me, when, and I wasn't often paying attention, but I was paying attention long enough to remember this, that you never have time to do it right, but you've always got time to do it over. So I got a chance to do it over, you know. Uh, and uh, my picture's on the wall out at that farm. You know, this guy is, is dangerous, you know. So uh, carryover herbicide, you know, there are some new products that we can use and, and bless, uh, bless their hearts. It's good to have more broadleaf compounds, broadleaf killing compounds, but realize some of them have some very long residuals and you just need to pay attention to what you're using the summer before you seed. I've already told you more than I know about herbicide residual right there, okay? Phone a friend, phone somebody smart. Legume competition. Don't put the clover in until the grass is fully established. When I started working in 1986, CRP was brand new, and every mother's son was in a heart attack hurry to get cropland seeded down to grass. Well, the rules say that you had to have a grass and a legume. Well, and they put out full rates of the legume, in a, and it was late. I went to work in early April, and shoot, we weren't talking about this till May, and you know what happens? The grass didn't make it. The clover did. And they got to go back in, as my dad would say, do it over, okay? And they were not too happy. So let's don't do that over. Let's put the grass in and get it started and then put the legume in. Uh, moisture conditions, of, of course, excessive one way or the other. And Dr. Lim Cooler talked about soil fertility, and we could spend some time on this. And, you know, it, there are scenarios that are becoming more and more frequent because custom mixing fertilizer for your farm is not such an easy thing to do depending on your location and your size. So I'll just say phosphorus and pH are crucial for establishment. A little bit about the value add of the Alliance Approved Seed. What they guarantee for you is that there is less than 5% off type, 70% viable endophyte in the seed, and look for that Alliance, Alliance Approved sticker all right, let me find this. There we go. Okay, this is a bag of Bar Optima. And of course, as a variety, you're going to have a the grass variety coupled with the endophyte variety name. And that's, that will, that's your clue that you're dealing with a novel endophyte tall fescue. So there's the label. This is another example. This is Jessup, the tall fescue Jessup, plus a novel endophyte, and I'll call your attention to this little square on there. It says, plant before May 15, 2014, or contact Pennington Seed to exchange for freshly tr tested seed. Now, this is, this is a dealer program, primarily, but if you're a producer and for whatever reason your seeding window didn't work right, you know, contact them, in the, and I've just spoken with them. They're here. They'll work with you about how to make sure that you're seeding down uh, seed that has viable endophyte in it. And it's one of the things we know is that the endophyte dies faster in that seed than the germination of the seed, okay? So you have to keep it cool. Uh, and so they want to make sure that when you get that stand, that it, it has a good stand of grass that has the endophyte, the novel endophyte viable and living in the plant keep moving. All right, drill set up, and, and Dr. Teutsch is going to uh, tell us all we need to know about setting up a drill, but I will tell you we're going to use a tie, but you know there's a, an example of this is actually a pretty, pretty heavy clay type soil up in Cynthiana area, and you can see what? What's that? Seed. Seed in the drill row. It was the right depth. What happened to me after this? It got really, really dry. But because the seed was at the right depth, it, it did well. Uh, but you're going to want to make sure it's at the right depth. You're also going to want to calibrate that drill, and Chris will walk us through that so that you don't run out of seed before you run out of farm. All right, so done with number two. Let's talk about that first year uh, and how we want to manage this so that this material stays around. One of the things that you want to keep in mind, and this will be a new management thought, is seed movement on the farm. We've talked about the seed is where how the, 
the, the old toxic endophyte is going to move from field to field. You don't want to move toxic fescue hay that had some mature seed in it into this field. You want to kind of keep it, you, you don't want it uh, to have that kind of hay fed there. So that's very important to, to take care of. The other thing I would mention, and we've talked a little bit about it today, and that is, is that cattle, Dr. Lemkuller said this, cattle will preferentially strip those seed off the heads and ingest them, okay? And they do remain viable on the other end, all right? So how long do they remain, how long does it take to clean them out if they're grazing that kind of, the old tall fescue? Here's the work from uh, Dr. Schmidt and uh, Shelby in Missouri. Takes about three days, two to three days for that, for the seed to be moved through them so that they're clean after that period of time. Make sense? That's a new management thing, a consideration when we have a novel in the fight tall fescue field. Okay, so some other first year management issues. Let's make sure that if we have not applied fertilizer that the soil test called for, that we get that done that first spring. In fact, it's a great idea to put some nitrogen down on that first spring to give yourself a good cutting of hay, but also to make those, those grass plants as strong as they can be and competitive with whatever broadleaf weeds might come in. Take that first cutting as hay. I've, I've told you I've got a demonstration going on by, almost literally behind my house. Uh, it is a horse farm, and, you know, of course, their barns are where their barns are, and that's where the horses are going to be. So they don't need to take a field out any longer than it has to be. So they want that field back. And so all, and we seeded it last fall. But I can tell you, with this kind of winter, there's no way on earth I want any, any horses out there right now because those fields are way too soft for the hoof traffic, okay? So you're going to want to take that first cutting as hay, all right? You don't want to get this far and then turn cattle out and they turn it into a mud lot, okay? So take the first cutting as hay and don't overgraze. Now, now the, the science has progressed uh, hugely in terms of making sure that the product that we're getting you into, we're talking about seeding, is tough, okay? And, and it'll last. But it, it doesn't make any sense to me that you plant a product like this and then you, you graze it like it was AstroTurf, right? It just doesn't make any sense. So be aware that one of the reasons the old fescue persisted was because when animals really got down into the stem base, they're getting a heck of a dose of that ergovaline toxin. And they, they're going to stop eating because they're sick, okay? Now they can graze it low, but they're not going to graze it as low and as frequently as they will this kind of a product. So, am I saying this is not a strong grass? No. But am I saying you, you want to manage it well? You betcha. You want to get paid well, and you don't get paid well when you overgraze fields. You may have to take a look at these fields in the spring for a weed control opportunity. You know, it, winter annual weeds just happen. I mean, buttercup, we seem to be the national... Uh, center of Diversity for Buttercup last spring. So make sure, you know, you haven't lost, lost this window to spray for broadleafs uh, in this first spring. Add the legumes later. Okay? So there we are. Four methods to kill the old and set yourself up to plant the new. There are some establishment problems that are fairly common. We can manage most of them. Mother Nature does bat last. All right? And... In that first year, you know, we can get it into production and get, it, get, get some benefit from it, but we still want to make sure we get that stand as strong as it can be for the long haul. So, thank you very much. I'll take questions if you have them. Yes. The question was, can the smother crop be any annual? Just about. Just about. Uh, there are, you know, pros and cons for different ones. I did not. I, the only cool season was talking about a fall planted small uh, summer, uh, winter annual. Yeah. I would probably avoid eating ryegrass. Yeah. 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 Bobby. The 
question was dealing with uh, controlling the seed heads and can you use chaparral in addition to other management tools. Somebody help me with chaparral and the label. Very good. I'll talk about chaparral later. But it's yeah. for herbicide that will also suppress pesky seed heads. So on that Kentucky 31 stand, to kill weeds, to knock back the seed heads from going to seed that year, I mean, it's a good management. And you can't see clovers back a few months after chaparral, but you can definitely see grass back that fall. Yeah, a great question. Well, in that case, you still need to do the two sprays in the summer on the 31. So midsummer and late summer before you seed. Um, but you suppress the seed heads, and usually it does a very good job. But you may still need to do mowing because you often drop the seed heads back to one-fifth or one-tenth of what's normal, but sometimes there'll still be some there. So you still want to keep um, look at it closely. Yeah. Yes. On the seventh first year of the following spring, I've got down all the stuff. Have you got any experience about the number of plants, how to evaluate the stand right now? I'm wondering if the number of plants, how about it says 25 plants to start with, uh, the number of, uh, because right now, The question was, is there, is there a numeric number to, to gauge or estimate a grass stand like we have with tall fescue? And Ray, I, I, I think I would, I, I'm thinking, is what you have uniform and is it giving you good ground cover? If you've got big bare areas and that's subjective, I, I don't have a, a number, but that's how I'd have to do it. Good 